Uh, she, she did all the work on putting all this together. So she's the expert on it. Yes. On the slides? No, I don't. Okay. Do you need the whole book? No, I've got the book. Okay. Yeah, take that, and as you study, not only for the class, but for your own knowledge, look up those scriptures. There's a lot of scriptures in there, but they're there to help you confirm, strengthen your faith, understand who God is, and why we should honor and glorify. Why should we even study about him? It's all there. He's revealed that to us. The Holy Spirit's revealed the mind of God to us. And the more we look at nature, the things around us, the more we'll see that, as Romans says, nature declares, it shouts it out that there's design, there's intelligence. All the things that we attribute to God are evident that there is a God. Okay, so from that point, if there is a God, who is he and what's his message for us? And that's, that's why we study to look at all the things that declare his handiwork so that we can be strong and increase our faith. <clears throat> now we finished lesson nine as far as going through the slides. And we said our God is so big, going back to lesson eight, he's so powerful. What are some of the he is so terms that you can think of? Holy. Holy. Set apart, sanctified, knowledgeable, knowledgeable. There's nothing he doesn't know. He knows everything. He designed it. He created it. He spoke it into being. No beginning or end. He just is. He's outside, and that's that's most of what lesson nine was. That he transcends. He goes beyond. He's outside of anything created. Time. He's not bound by time. He's bigger than that. He's not bound by space. He's bigger than that. He's not bound by whatever. We have physical limitations. We're finite. He is infinite. We, and, and our finite minds and our finite vocabularies have trouble wrapping around what is infinite. Right. <clears throat> well, that's that's our realm. Time and, and physical matter are because of his power. He's all powerful. There's nothing greater than that. So when we put up a statement, am I too dirty for God to cleanse? No. And we put up a statement that says, am I too broken for God to fix? No. Am I too far away that God can't reach me? I can put myself in a position, and talks about in Hebrews, I can, or Paul talks about it too, I can be callous to the point that his word doesn't mean anything. But he can reach me. <clears throat> Am I too guilty for God to forgive? 
No. He sent the perfect payment for that guilt. Am I too worthless for God to love? No. I, God doesn't make junk. Everyone has value and, and is worth something. So when we look at Lesson 9 and, and to talk about the transcendence, another big word, what does that mean? What does transcend mean? How do you describe that? That's question one in your lesson material. Go to go beyond. To transcend is to go beyond. He's bigger than. Jack? I said go beyond anything we can imagine. Yeah. At the same time, for two or three are gathered together, he's there also. <coughs> He knows it all. And when it says he transcends, he goes beyond. He's greater than, bigger than. <clears throat> Outside of. So whatever was created, he's outside of that. Out of nothing, yeah. yeah. That relates to creation. How he created everything out of nothing, from nothing. The only thing that was used for creation was his power. And as smart as we are in, in physics and nuclear physics and looking at all the components of atoms and how they're made and how they're structured and how they work, we don't know anything yet. Probably never will. We know just a little bit. But it comes down to what are all those particles? Their power. Their energy. And we can see where they've been. We can't see what they're doing. We can't stop an electron. But we can see its path. We stop it, it goes away. <laughs> what, what happened to it? We can convert matter to energy. And this is Walt's opinion. God converted energy to matter. We will never be... We can't do that. We try all kinds of things. We've, we've converted matter to plasmas and the different forms of energy, different forms of matter. God's beyond that. He created it to start with. So what does John 4.24 tell us? Somebody look that up. Okay. That's a part of us, again, that we don't see. We don't, and I don't fully understand spiritual type things the spiritual realm. I know a little bit from what's been told to us. But God's not physical. He's not matter. He's spirit. So when I worship Him, what's that mean? That I must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Two parts to that. Okay. Exactly. Because that statement was made to the Samaritan woman. And she's saying, you guys, you Jews, say you got to go to Jerusalem to worship, but we say we got to go over here to Mount, whatever it was, Gerizim, Ebal. And that's where we worship. And Christ told her, there's a time and it's now. If you go worship God, you worship in spirit and truth. Okay, what's the truth part? The only, only th way I know what's truth is to go back to his word, what he's revealed. And God is truth. There's, there's, 
I, I can't make assumptions on anything that, that he's told me. There's a lot I, I don't understand, and I can play those games all day long. But when he's revealed something to me, that's fact. I can't change it. <clears throat> How is man made? That's question three. Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image. So there we have a clue that there's multiple personalities, multiple identities, plural, Elohim is plural. Let us make man in our image. Well, in what way are we like in the image of God? We, we're a dual being. We're a spiritual being wrapped up in a physical body. That's a temporary thing because at some point, this body's going to go away. Okay. We have a body, but we are spirit. We are so that's that's who I am. Now when God created that, He gave me an identity that will last forever. I had a beginning, but I have no end as far as the spiritual side of it. In what way are we not like God? Okay, he's incorruptible or uncorruptible, either way. He can't be corrupted, he doesn't deteriorate, either way you want to look at it. He cannot be tempted, and we are. Okay. There's nothing that tempts him. Everything tempts us. I mean, <laughs> he's the creator, and we're the created. He's the creator, we're the created. <clears throat> Right. And incorruptible. That part of us. In that we will exist on. That, on right. Life. So, in, in that sense, those are more likenesses. But where we exist is going to dictate. That's a, our decision on, on where we do it. Now, we also have, he created and that he created matter and all these things. And, and I look at the Hubble telescope pictures and some of those things that, wow. Man can't see those things. Who did he create that for? God enjoyed doing what he does. He gave us the ability to bring things together and create, in a limited way, create art to create structures so we have some of that but we don't have it like he does well, <clears throat> birds build nests. the birds don't know right from wrong they're amoral and on the other hand we in the image of God know, know right from wrong right and, and God revealed through his prophets several times but Micah 6, 8 is one that pretty plainly spells it out. Then when, when Micah asked the Israelites, what does God really want from you? You're doing all these things. You're performing all these religious ceremonies. You're offering all these sacrifices. What's God really want from you? He wants you to do the right thing. He says, do justice. What's that? Do the right thing. Love kindness. Be merciful. Be helpful. Walk humbly before God. Recognize that God is. For all the things he made, <clears throat> then it tells us the fear of God is his treasure. Okay. Uh, and Proverbs tells us the fear of God is the beginning of understanding. To fear, respect, to honor. Now, Fear you can use any way you want to, and that's the way we ought to look at God. I'm afraid of him if I'm doing wrong. Again, that's the two-year-old looking at his daddy. Man, if I'm doing wrong, I don't want to see daddy. 
but if I'm in trouble, I want to go to daddy. Okay, that's a fear from a physical standpoint. But I need to fear and respect and honor and respect. But Hebrews 6 tells us, was it Hebrews 6? Hebrews 11, 6. That I can't please God unless I believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So I've got an assignment when, I, when He puts me here. I need to seek God so that I can please Him. And the verse before it, uh, verse 5, says that <clears throat> we need to walk uh, before God and please Him. Right. Now, Enoch was one of those characters that didn't experience death. Right. I only know of two. <laughs> but in, from, from that, but okay. What is the term, it's question four. If we look at Psalms, the Psalms are full of it. Hosea, Matthew. What is the term frequently used to describe God? Holy. Holy. Can we define holy? I mean, we, we've got words that say, okay, holy is set apart, and holy is sanctified, and holy is... Holy is pure. Undefiled. Undefiled. Can't be defiled. He tells us, you be holy because I am holy. Well, I can't be the holy that he is, but I can be set aside, I can be separated, I can be dedicated to his service. With the help of his son, we can't be worthy. With the help of his son, because by myself, it ain't going to happen. Okay. And, and, we're kind of getting a little off track with that, but that's important to understand that when God, when we put on Christ, we put him on like an overcoat. Well, what does God see when he looks at me and I've put on Christ? He sees the overcoat of Christ. He doesn't see all the dumb stuff I've done. He sees Christ's blood. And that's what makes it possible for me to be holy. What, in question five, what made places holy? In Exodus 3, 5, God tells, tells Moses, Take off your sandals, sandals because where you're standing is holy ground. Why? God's presence. And the fact that he said so. <laughs> All right, you can't get any better than that. Sometimes, have you ever told your kids, because I said so? Yes, we all have that have kids. Because sometimes that's the answer. <clears throat> What other things were made holy because of God's presence? What's Exodus 19.6? A holy nation. Israel was holy because of God. The Sabbath. Exodus 20 verse 8. <clears throat> Tabernacle. Temple. The censers that they offered incense from. What about Jericho? Okay. And the, the items from Jericho were holy because God said, because God said so, that's the first place in the land, it's mine. The first fruits are mine. The first fruits, and I'm pointing at me, I'm not God, but God was saying, 
the first, the best, belongs to Him. Yes. Sure. application of holy versus the state of being holy. And it helps me to understand that when I am forgiven and in a right state with God, then, then I'm in a state of holiness. Right. But there are things that I do then after that in my thoughts or behavior or reaching out with anger or, or something in malice If I continue in it without repentance, so it's pure. Okay, we're saying we're saying the same thing. But he sees me. He doesn't see Christ. He sees me in that state of holiness. He sees me. He sees me with a stamp that says you belong to Christ. Yes, sir. So I, okay. I just I know when I was when I was in a Baptist well back years ago. It's common in the Baptist community to believe that God doesn't see me. He sees Christ. Okay. And so I don't think God sees thousands of Christ. He no, he, he sees people that belong to Christ. So I'm careful with the idea that you don't, you don't. Okay. I like that. That's, that. that's a better explanation of it. I just want to be careful with that. My own, my own background and my own. Okay. Experience. But it's the same thing with, you know, First Corinthians talks about the Jews being our Passover. Mm hmm. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for that yeah. symbol. Just like he saw the blood on the post and passed over the house of where the Israelites were living back in Egypt. That's the same way, similar. Well, and, and if you take that illustration or that example of, of the Passover in Egypt, he knew that there were sinful people inside those houses. But they were obedient in that they had followed his instructions. And that's what God's looking for. Am I obedient? Have I put on Christ? Do I have the Holy Spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I belong to Christ? And doesn't the word atonement mean to cover? It does, and if you take atonement and break it down, it's at one meant. I am one with, the, with what God wants me to do. Okay. In Romans 6 is that pattern of a death when you die, you give up the old life of sin. You bury him. But he raised just like Christ was raised symbolically. And that new creature that was raised is what God's looking for. Not the perfect being. I'm not going to be perfect. But have I been redeemed? Have I been bought back? Have I been covered with the blood of Christ? And by covering, that's what I meant when I put on that overcoat. I've been covered with, the God, with Christ's blood. And he sees me and he knows I'm an imperfect human. But he also sees that I've been bought back. I've been redeemed. Right. 
So all of those things are important concepts to understand, but he's big enough and powerful enough and great enough to be able to do that for us. Okay, so we talked about holy things, holy places. In question six, what's the best word that describes God's location other than every place? High. Heaven. Most high. Highest. And again, that's a relative term because we're limited into our understanding of physical things. Well, where's high? And we point up. Well, what part of this sphere are you sitting on and where's up? <laughs> Away from this earth. <laughs> okay, so those are relative terms, but they're, it's, it depends on your point of view and, and, and the physics of all that. But that's not what he's talking about. God's above, beyond, transcends, and so we look up. You know, we, we sometimes use the expression, I'm going to look out for my fellow man. I'm going to look in at what I'm doing, and I'm going to look up to God. Those are just relative terms that we can somehow, some, however feeble it is, describe where we are. <clears throat> what does it tell us? I put a square around the word place for God to dwell in the place. So there's not a place that's that talking about, you know, my heart. Well, here. <laughs> Yeah, the, the answer to number seven is no. Is up there to be taken literally as God's dwelling place? No, it's all a relative term. Figurative term is a better word. But all of those scriptures tell us that. God's not bound by physics. He's not bound by physical location. He's not bound by anything that we're bound by. <clears throat> All right, body parts. If somebody, what's what's the first one? Exodus thirty three twenty. Face. Okay, Moses was not allowed to see his face. No man has seen my face and lived. You can see my backside as I go by. And again, that's a figurative term. Because Moses didn't see God's back. God manifested himself in several... It, that whole group, and, and you talk about Isaiah. There's this big storm. Is God in it? No. There's this earthquake. Is God in it? No. What are all the things that, that he sees that, and he asks the question, is God in it? No. In this small, still, quiet voice. Whoa, there's God. What's Job see? I mean, Job's got all these questions in, in chapter 38 and 40 and so forth about, I want to see my adversary, I want to see who's... I want to challenge God, and God says, Job, where were you when? And Job says, Excuse me, hush my mouth. So those are just, you know, he describes himself in terms that we can understand in our limited way. But if I see somebody's face, we have a song. Let his face shine upon you. Somebody's facing you, usually it's approval. You're training an animal. If you turn your back on them, they understand that that's not approving. Look at a horse trainer sometime. Look at the body language that a horse trainer uses 
to train horses. And I'm not a horse trainer. My grandfather was a mule trainer. And I've read some about it. But when they're, we're facing, we see the face of God, we're looking for approval. It's not just that we see the face. He's accepting of us. We can come to him when he's, when he's facing us. <clears throat> Psalms 11, Psalm 34, Isaiah, what's, what's the next part you come up with? Eyes. What did Hagar describe God as? The God who sees. She'd given up. She had placed Ishmael under whatever shade she could find and had moved away from him to watch him die. He says, the angel of the Lord came, told her, it's all in Exodus, or Genesis rather. And she described him as the God who sees. Now that can be great and it can be fearful. It's great that God sees me. And, it, and, and I use the expression sometimes with you that it's good to be seen. But with God, it is truly good to be seen as one of His. It's totally fearful to be seen if I'm not one of his or if I've been misbehaving. Your mom ever put the hairy eyeball on you? <laughs> Could she look across the room and give you that look and said, hmm, I better straighten up real quick. Okay, there's, there's several ways that we can be seen. But God has eyes. He has the ability to, to see everything that's going on. He even sees the thoughts of my heart. He sees every little detail. He sees the sparrows that falls. He sees the number of hair on my head. <clears throat> What's the next part? Ear. Now some of you have trouble hearing. I know Jack wears hearing aids and, and there's several others that wear hearing aids because hearing is important. But God hears. He doesn't need a hearing aid. He can hear my thoughts. He hears when I pray when I don't know how to pray. He hears and understands the Holy Spirit helps him or helps me with prayer. But God hears. He listens. He cares. Now what's it mean to listen? Am I thinking of my response to you while you're talking? Or am I listening to what you're saying? Do we actively, there's a term out there called active listening where you listen to the person and sometimes you ask the person in different words is this what you said so that the communication you know is clear we don't always listen to each other that's just that's who we are but God listens <clears throat> next, next part of the body. <clears throat> Numbers 12, Psalm 18. Mouth. He can give blessing. He can give rebukes. He can give praise. As he did with Christ. This is my beloved son. And this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. He can discipline us with words. <clears throat> he can discipline it, and he will discipline with other methods, but his mouth is important. He's told us what he wants. 
What does God want from you? Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly before God. There's other things involved, but that kind of boils it down. Psalm 18. What's, what part of the body is that one? Nostrils. Okay, there's several ways to look at that. He's living. He is. Again, go back to a horse. If you ever see a horse flare his nostrils, usually that's either out of fear or anger. And you need to back up. Okay, if God's flaring his nostrils at us, as he did to Israel and kept warning them, he's going to breathe fire on them, was the idea. What about an arm? What can an arm do? Okay, it can be power, protect, wrap around you, comfort. You can't go yet, Scott. I got bored. <laughs> we talk about being in the arms of God. Solace, comfort, protection, no fear. Again, that symbolic hands. What do we do with hands? We grasp, we pat, we hold. All the things that we can relate to our behavior and activities, God does. His feet. We're mobile. We go. God doesn't need feet because He's every place at once. But it means that He can come to us. <clears throat> so some of the other bodily movements, and we'll try to finish this up. What kind of bodily movements does He have? Looking, sitting, standing, Walking, treading, stomping. Spewing out. Spewing out. And uh, one verse says he's going to come down. He arose. He wrote. He wrote on their hearts. So what passages, what do we see about his transcendence to summarize it? Unseen, invisible, no form, immortal, uncorruptible, incorruptible. Jack? In all this study, Isaiah 55 came to mind. So all of those things are just mental pictures, word pictures for our benefit to help understand God Almighty, who God is. And by understanding that, then I have a better idea of what I need to be doing. Okay, we'll begin Lesson 10 Wednesday night. Okay, next Sunday, because we're going to sing Wednesday night. And if you haven't put your song list back there, be sure you do that. Thank you for your help.